When looking back at the 90s, you realize just how expansive of a decade it was musically. You had alternative acts like Nirvana finding huge success, metal had its reawakening in the form of Pantera, and Britpop bands like Oasis and Blur made a huge impact as well. These are only a few examples. In the midst of this blossoming musical landscape, along came Jeff Buckley. Jeff's music has largely been described as soulful rock and roll with a profound sensitivity, his angelic voice being the main ingredient behind its power. Buckley and his band would make some serious waves in the middle part of the 1990s, with the release of a now iconic album before tragedy struck only a few years later. This is the story of Jeff Buckley, an artist we lost way too soon with loads of potential in the infancy of his career. Jeff Buckley was born in Anaheim, California on November 17, 1966. Jeff showed interest in music at a very young age, as both of his parents were musicians. His mother, Mary Gaber, played cello and piano, and most notably his father, Tim Buckley, was a prominent folk artist throughout the 60s and 70s. His 1969 album, Happy Sad, is perhaps his most well-known, having cultivated a strong cult following along with critical acclaim. Unfortunately, Jeff's parents split when he was very young, and he only had the chance to meet his father once in 1975. Shortly after, Tim Buckley would die at 28 years old from an overdose. In the mid to late 70s, Jeff's mother would marry Rob Moorhead, who notably helped Jeff develop his love for rock music. Introducing him to Led Zeppelin, Physical Graffiti would be the record that inspired Jeff to realize he wanted to be a musician. At 14, Buckley would acquire his first real guitar for his birthday, being a Les Paul. In high school, he began to play in local bands, officially sinking his teeth into that world. Covering bands such as The Police, ACDC, and Led Zeppelin, Buckley would very quickly become an exceptional guitar player. He graduated from Laura High School, and later attended the Musicians Institute in Los Angeles. Throughout the late 80s, Buckley would continue his musical journey, playing with many different bands such as Group Therapy. He even ended up backing the dancehall pioneer Shinehead. At this point, Jeff wasn't really much of a singer. He would devote his time to honing his craft as a guitarist. There was no style of music he didn't learn to play, from ska to hair metal. In 1990, Buckley recorded his first four-track demo, featuring early cuts of two songs that would appear on his debut album, Eternal Life and Last Goodbye. That year, 1990, Buckley would relocate to New York City, which is where he would reside for years to come. This is the place Buckley began to truly find his voice. He would play a show that year at St. Anne's Warehouse in Brooklyn, in which he would honor his late father. But after that night, following comparisons to his father, Jeff vowed to carve his own path creatively. Instead of living in his father's shadow, he would make sure the world would come to know him for him and only him. Buckley would briefly be a part of the psychedelic rock band Gods and Monsters, which featured Captain Beefheart guitarist Gary Lucas. The group did gain some local buzz, but upon exiting, Jeff quickly began to attract his own buzz. He became a regular performer at some of the better-known New York venues, especially Shanae. Buckley gradually started getting more and more attention from crowds in awe and even record labels. In the summer of 1992, he signed to Columbia Records for a $1 million three-album deal. All of a sudden, something that seemed out of reach had become a reality. The first commercial release we would see from Jeff Buckley would come in December 1993 in the form of a four-song EP. It was recorded live during a routine performance at Shanae. By the time of its release, Buckley had already gotten some musicians together to begin recording his debut album. With Mick Grandel on bass and Matt Johnson on drums, the trio would enter Bearsville Studios in Woodstock, New York to record seven tracks. These tracks would appear on the final album. Well into the recording process, guitarist Michael Ty would be added to the lineup of the band. Buckley picked Andy Wallace to produce the album, who was known for working with Nirvana, The Colts, and Slayer, among others. The album was recorded mostly live in five to six weeks. By early 1994, recording for Buckley's upcoming record had wrapped. He would spend the following couple months as a solo artist playing clubs, coffee houses, and lounges, continuing to build a name for himself. 
By April 94, Buckley regrouped with his band to rehearse for the tour and promotion of the new record. This tour would be deemed the Peyote Radio Theater Tour and kicked off in early June. The group would remain on the road until the middle part of August, just a week shy of the record's release. This lull in touring would be incredibly short-lived, but we'll come back to that soon. For now, let's get into Grace, Jeff Buckley's one and only official record, which was released on August 23rd, 1994. Jeff Buckley's debut album Grace was initially somewhat of a commercial letdown. The masses were rather slow to subscribe to this contemplative sound, while edgy alternative rock was in full bloom. But the record did end up finding a sizable audience, which grew larger over time. Grace wasn't nearly as appreciated back then, but the record helped Jeff Buckley attain a strong cult following and critical acclaim. People knew his music had a special quality, but it wasn't quite understood yet. I guess you could say he was ahead of his time. Let's dive into the record itself. Mojo Pin opens Grace on a very hypnotic note. Jeff's angelic vocals cascade across the track as light flourishes of guitar accompany during the verses. Buckley has stated Mojo Pin is about a dream he had, lyrically feeling very ambiguous. This track was co-written by Gary Lucas, who worked with Buckley in his previous band Gods and Monsters. The title track immediately opens with infectious energy. Instrumentally, it takes a lot of influence from the alt-rock of the late 80s and early 90s, with chords that scream heartbroken angst, along with the rather meaty bass tone and powerful drum work. But Buckley's signature falsetto helps bring Grace to the next level. Gary Lucas helped co-write this one as well. Last Goodbye is an incredibly melodic moment and instantly sticks with you. Thus far, the most overtly heartbroken track, detailing the end of a relationship. They still love one another, but realize they're just not meant to be. So naturally, Last Goodbye contains a very bittersweet vibe, as Buckley lays down lines such as, But it's over, just hear this and then I'll go. You gave me more to live for, more than you'll ever know. The emotional weight of Grace continues to slowly crush the listener on Lilac Wine. Quite a haunting moment that masterfully showcases Buckley's delicate guitar work and emotional vocals. So Real is another one that fit in perfectly with the moody alternative jams of the time. The main riff here, brought to the table by Michael Ty, is incredibly powerful, harboring an unforgettable chorus. Buckley repeats Oh That Was So Real countless times, yet it never loses its resonance. Now we arrive at the cover that continues to define Jeff Buckley to this day, Hallelujah, originally by Leonard Cohen. Buckley performed this one entirely by himself, live in the studio, with its minor imperfections only adding to the raw talent on display here. Easily one of the greatest covers of all time, definitely being the best rendition of this Leonard Cohen classic. Buckley truly makes Hallelujah his own here, with enough soul and conviction to make even the most stoic person choke up. Jeff shines in every way, especially vocally, striking an emotional chord very few vocalists can. Lover You Should Have Come Over presses forward, not at all easing up on the raw emotion. As Jeff continues to write of heartbreak and loneliness, he takes you on this journey with him as he enters a state of reflection. There's lines that allude to Buckley potentially being unfaithful, and that's the reason this once lively relationship is now in shambles. Or maybe, as Buckley states, he's a bit too young and immature to truly know how to love someone. Corpus Christi Carol is a Benjamin Britten cover, really showing off Buckley's voice that genuinely sounds ethereal. A rather short and sparse moment that utilizes minimalism in favor of Buckley's vocals that, as always, lead the way. Eternal Life absolutely rocks out. A high-octane track with the guitar in overdrive. An angry cut that speaks on the pointlessness of hatred and the senselessness of war. Buckley stated he had Martin Luther King in mind here, as well as World War II while penning this track. Overall, a fantastic moment in the back half that contains a strong message. Grace comes to a close with Dream Brother, an ode to a self-destructive friend that can't seem to escape himself, drenched in psychedelia. Here's a quote from Jeff describing the meaning of the track. It is very hard not to give in to one's negative feelings. Life is total chaos. Buckley seems to be coming to terms with the confusing experience of being human. The instrumentals reflect this feeling of acceptance as well. A contemplative closer, slow in building, eventually reaching a climax a little over halfway through. As the final seconds come and go, you realize fairly quickly you've just experienced a musical masterpiece. Before moving forward, 
Forget Her is an outtake from the Grey Sessions I need to mention. Apparently, Bugly thought this song was too simple and straightforward, so he decided to remove it from the tracklist, which is a huge bummer. Forget Her captures what Jeff Buckley did best, reels you in with his musical brilliance, and wins you over with his vulnerability and genuine conviction. 1994's Grace is a landmark album, not only within rock and roll, but music at large. What Jeff Buckley and the gang accomplished here remains majestic and unique all these years later. Very few musicians throughout history have been able to convey such powerful feelings in the moving way Buckley did. Following Grace, life remained largely the same for Jeff and his band. The record opened the door for a lot more opportunities, and Jeff Buckley certainly became more known, but huge success was still ways away. There was no hit single that made Buckley an overnight sensation. In promotion of Grace, Jeff Buckley and his band extensively toured for the rest of 1994 with hardly a break. A European tour kicked things off right on the heels of Grace's release, before the band returned to the States and went back to New York. On New Year's Eve 1994, Buckley returned to Chennai for a solo set. The next day, he recited a poem to ring in the new year at St. Mark's Church Marathon poetry reading. Shortly after, Jeff and the band continued on their demanding schedule of touring. They returned to Europe, but also played in multiple other countries such as Japan, Germany, France, and more. This batch of shows began in January 95 and concluded in March. Buckley was slowly beginning to garner a strong reputation for his talents and stage presence. In April 1995, Quite the unexpected happened. Grace had earned Jeff and the band a prestigious award in France. This award had been previously given to Bob Dylan and Joni Mitchell, among many others, making this quite a big deal. Along with this, the record was also certified gold. The award and the gold record only further solidified Jeff Buckley's growing relevance in the music industry. Following this award and the end of the Grace Tour, drummer Matt Johnson would leave the band, and Jeff was having a hard time finding a replacement. At the same time, Columbia was hankering for a follow-up to Grace. This was a period in which the pressure was beginning to get to Buckley. The increasing number of obsessive fans, label expectations, and Matt's leaving were causing a great deal of stress. Buckley was also in significant debt to Columbia Records. Parker Kindred was eventually recruited as the new drummer, which helped get things back on track. Jeff's initial affinity for New York began to wane as his notoriety grew more substantial. Not to mention, he now had the task of writing new songs for his sophomore record. For the second record, circumstances were entirely different. With Grace, Buckley had already written most of the tracks long before recording. This time around, he hardly had any new material. But now with contractual obligations, work needed to be done quickly. Following a couple failed recording sessions in New York throughout 1996, Buckley and the band would head down to Memphis to record in February 97. Tom Verlaine of Television was brought on board to produce the album. Recording for the second record was not panning out very well, even in Memphis. It was very clear Buckley was going through some internal conflict, as the pressure weighed on him. Relations within the band were more tense than ever. He was becoming unsure of his future in the music industry, no longer confident this was the path for him. Ultimately, Buckley was ill-prepared to enter the studio. His vision wasn't fully there, and the songs had yet to be adequately fleshed out or realized. The cracks were beginning to show in a big way. The band would fly back to New York while Buckley remained in Memphis. Buckley rented a house and would go through a period of isolation. The majority of his time was spent with the four-track crafting songs, as his band was anxiously waiting for material back in New York. Finally, in the peace and serenity of Memphis, Jeff was able to write and record demo tracks in rapid succession. He was now creatively in the zone once again, following a decently long lull after Grace. In mid-February 1997, the band would regroup in Memphis. Upon hearing Buckley's demos featuring new tracks and some reworked tracks from the Verlaine sessions, there was a feeling of excitement in the air. This material was classic Buckley, building upon the sound of Grace, but taking its own unique direction. Some new tracks would be debuted live that month. Jeff had worked his magic, and now there were enough tracks to record the sophomore album. Recording was still far off, as extensive rehearsals were necessary to bring the songs to life, but Jeff was productive as ever, 
as he began to play Monday night solo shows at Barrister's Bar, starting in late March 1997. Jeff and the band were slated to begin three weeks of rehearsal for the upcoming album in May 1997. Andy Wallace was to be brought back to produce the album instead of Tom Verlaine, but unfortunately, recording never came to fruition. On May 29, 1997, Jeff and his roadie, Keith, went down to the Wolf River with a guitar and a boombox. They were on their way to begin rehearsals, but Jeff wanted to take a detour for a quick swim. Later that night, as the band was set up and awaiting Buckley's arrival, they were starting to get a bit concerned. He had been so excited to begin work, so it seemed rather odd for him to be so late. Keith Fody then called the band and told them the tragic news. While he was swimming, Jeff, fully clothed, went under and was nowhere to be found. The band quickly made their way down to the river. Jeff was considered missing for a bit, but his body would ultimately be found on June 4th, 1997. He was only 30 years old. There were no traces of drugs in his system. Death in general is incredibly tragic and very difficult to come to grips with, but death before one's time is even harder to process. Jeff Buckley was in the infancy of his music career, he only had the chance to put out one record, and I truly believe he had way more masterpieces in him. One of those rare talents that had the ability to bring magic to everything he did. The second album Jeff and the band were working on would see a release in 1998. Sketches for My Sweetheart the Drunk would be the title. While mostly consisting of demos and outtakes, this compilation release contains a ton of merit. It's a two-disc affair, clocking in at over 90 minutes, and gives you a glimpse into the genius this record would have been. The Sky is a Landfill kicks off disc 1, soundwise picking up right where Grace left off, definitely feeling like a logical progression of Buckley's sound. Lyrically, he makes mentions of being a slave to the system, which seems to be a jab at the music industry. This track is very reminiscent of Eternal Life from Grace. It's energetic and rocks out nicely. Everybody Here Wants You, which was the only single of this release, sees Buckley straight up delving into R&B territory. The thing is, nearly any rock musician trying to pull this off would fall flat on their face. Yet for Buckley, not only does this shift in sound work, it's actually quite majestic. A very romantic sounding track that is irresistible and further proof of Buckley's versatility. Nightmares by the Sea takes a more brooding approach in instrumentation. A very emotional track about young lovers and the complicated nature of intimacy. Morning Theft is an especially haunting number largely considered to be a song for Elizabeth Frazier of the Cocteau Twins. Buckley and Frazier had a strong attraction to one another, ultimately leading to a rather intense relationship that unfortunately would come to an end with little closure. For that reason, Morning Theft is pretty somber looking back on it. Vancouver is easily one of the strongest cuts here, a fairly short track that's as anthemic as it is introspective. It remains in the mid-tempo range most of its runtime, before the final 30 seconds reach an epic climax. Buckley sings with such desperation as he yearns for sanctuary. Now onto disc 2, Haven't You Heard has all the angsty qualities of grunge both in lyrics and instrumentation. This track is undeniably fun, though rough around the edges, which tends to work in its favor. Demon John treads into experimental territory, as Buckley toys with a different vocal style. He sounds very loose here, settling into his cool, as some rowdy guitar work accompanies. Satisfied Mind comes from a performance Buckley did for WFMU Radio back in 1992. While the back half of disc 2 feels especially undercooked for obvious reasons, this moment, while minimal, acts as a return to form. Classic Buckley, just him and his guitar, with intense emotion oozing from every note. Originally written by Joe Hayes and Jack Rhodes, this cover is as beautiful as it is somber. A nice traditional folk track to properly end this two disc affair. For a mini review, Disc 2 is clearly inferior to Disc 1, as Disc 2 gets progressively more unfinished as it goes on. The highlights are mostly found on the first disc. But as the title of the album states, these tracks are only sketches of what would have been the final album. For what it's worth, this release does contain a number of standouts that do, at times, rival moments from Grace. If anything, Sketches for My Sweetheart the Drunk gives you an idea of the direction Buckley was taking 
growing bolder and bolder as a songwriter. A number of additional posthumous releases followed in the years after Jeff's death, including Songs to No One, which compiles early tracks from 1991 to 1992, You and I compiling a number of brilliant covers Buckley recorded back in 1993, along with a slew of various live albums, best of releases, and so on and so forth. Jeff Buckley's presence certainly hasn't faded, even though physically he's been gone for over 25 years. As time goes on, Jeff Buckley's artistic legacy continues to grow. Though we lost him in 1997, interest in Jeff's music has grown exponentially since his untimely passing. Very few artists throughout history have such a distinct, angelic voice like Buckley's. He was an incredibly unique and versatile musician, as well as a very down-to-earth person. A genuine soul in a world in which being genuine has become increasingly rare. Jeff Buckley was an artist that could never be replicated. A rare talent that certainly will never be forgotten. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. What's your favorite Jeff Buckley song? Comment down below. Not an easy question, but hopefully it'll evoke some discussion. More music-related content coming soon here on The Music Narrative.